Thanks for joining us for part two, the conclusion of the Dwight Evans story. When we left off, Dwight had just won his first of eight gold gloves. Narrator Dick Flavin picks up the story as Dwight, already one of the best fielders in the game, becomes one of the best hitters in the game in this special edition of the Red Sox Report presented by CVS Pharmacy. The 1978 season was bittersweet. Dwight hit 24 homers and was selected to the All-Star team for the first time. He also won his second gold glove. The Sox raced to a 10-game lead in the division by July and still led by nine games in mid-August. And here comes Smith, here comes Smith. He's gonna score and it's over. The ball game is over and Dwight Evans won the ball game. But on August 28th, as the Sox lead began crumbling, Dwight was hit in the head by a pitch his season and the Sox went downhill. I think I saw the last second, it just turned my head and it hit me right behind the ear. Shattered my helmet and I woke up in the hospital. I, you know, they carried me off. And, but when I woke up in the hospital, my head never hurt like that. It affected my inner ear and I had an inner ear problem. You turn your head and it just starts spinning and you get sick. Uh, walk off a curb and, and you know, you start spinning and you fall down. The dizziness from that beaning lasted almost three years. Despite that, 1979 was the third time he led the league in outfield assists. By then he was known to have the best arm of any outfielder of his time. But his hitting was inconsistent. He was batting under 200 and he was benched. Dwight hit bottom uh, offensively uh, at the end of June and early July of 1980. And we were in Minnesota and he was hitting 181 and manager Don Zimmer had to put Jim Dwyer in the right field replacing Dwight. And that was quite a, a crushing blow to Dwight. He asked Sox hitting coach Walt Riniak for help. We worked on a weight shift and we worked on a lot of things, but we worked on hitting the ball through the middle. We tried to get him uh, off the plate. We tried to give him a balanced, workable stance. We tried to get him some movement in the stance to de decrease the tension. We try to get him to shift his weight more to the front side instead of staying behind the ball too much. We try to get him to put his head down on the ball, watch the ball better. Try to get him to use the whole field, hit the ball in the middle of the field, and then try to get a good uh, finish in the swing. Drive deep to left center field. This ball is deep, deep, gone. It's a home run. Three run homer for Evans. I think I ended up hitting 320 the rest of that year, but I ended up hitting like only 260. Probably the most uh, critical and amazing thing was that he made a complete change at what, 25, 26 years old after having some success in the big leagues, and the change was drastic. With hits and walks coming more frequently, in 1981, Sox manager Ralph Houck moved Dwight from sixth to second in the batting order. I was getting more bats. I had more RBIs, had more runs scored, had more hits, had more home runs. And that really helped me out. That was, that was big, but I, but I excelled in that position, hitting second, I loved it. In that strike-shortened season, Dwight was again an all-star, tied for the league lead in homers and led the league in walks, on-base percentage, and total bases. And in the field, he began a streak of winning five consecutive gold gloves. He was third in the American League Most Valuable Player voting. It was the beginning of an incredible decade for the Red Sox star. We'll cover that when the Red Sox Report, presented by CVS Pharmacy, continues.
By the early 1980s, Dwight Evans had established himself as the best defensive right fielder in the game. And thanks to his work with Sox hitting coach Walt Riniak, he was becoming one of the most dangerous hitters as well. Through the 80s, I'm very proud of it. I, I led the uh, American League in home runs in the 80s, and I led all of baseball in extra base hits. And you, you, know, you had Mike Schmidt and George Brett and all these guys out there. And uh, I was right there in RBIs and runs scored. So I was proud of that. It showed me that I had accomplished something by making a change, and, and it proved to me that that change was, was a good change. But there were life-changing challenges off the field. Susan and Dwight now had three children, Timothy, Kirsten, and Justin. The boys were born with neurofibromatosis, an ailment characterized by tumors, usually benign, that needed to be removed. Each of the Evans boys endured multiple, painful, life-threatening surgeries. I uh, couldn't be prouder of, of those two. and proud of my daughter. Um, she has four children. I always told Tim when I took him in that he's my hero. He's my hero, and, and Justin was my hero because they knew it was going to happen, and they kept fighting it, and they kept going at it with, with a tremendous desire. He never said what was going on in our life because he never wanted to have an excuse if he had a bad day at the plate. He didn't want that to be the reason used while he just brought his son to surgery and, you know, so his mind is occupied. Following one of his more than 30 surgeries, Dwight's oldest son had a request. I said, Tim, I love you. He said, I love you too, Dad. He says, can you hit me a home run tonight? I said, oof, yeah. You know, <laughs> I said, I'm going to try, Tim. I'll really try. That night I hit a home run. The next day, <clears throat> I'm getting ready to go to the ballpark and been with him most of the day. And he says, Dad, would you hit me another home run tonight? And I looked at him and I go, all right, Tim, I'll try. And then, and then as I'm going to the door and walking out, he says, Dad, would you hit me two home runs tonight? Now, now I'm starting to panic a little bit because I didn't like, once I hit a home run, the worst thing I could do is try to hit another one. And I, I, I hit two home runs that night. And, you know, Fortunately, he got out of the hospital the next day where he wasn't going to ask me to hit another one. But it was a divine experience for, for our family and for that moment. On the field, by 1984, Dwight was a perennial two-way star. He led the league in runs and extra base hits. On June 28th of 84, he hit for the cycle. We got in the extra innings and, and uh, were tied. And I, I wasn't thinking about hitting a home run, but I had a three-run home run to uh, win the game, and, and uh, I didn't find out until I got in the clubhouse that I had a cycle. And you know, and to me, it was like, so what? You know, it was we won the game. That's what it was all about. 1985 marked Dwight's eighth Gold Glove in 10 years. The Sox 1986 American League Championship season began with Dwight leading off. We'll cover that when the Red Sox report, presented by CVS Pharmacy, continues. The Sox 1986 American League Championship season began with Dwight leading off. The first pitch of the season was a sign of things to come. I started leading off in spring training. I knew that that was going to lead up to opening day, and I knew that Morris was the pitcher. And for some reason, I had a dream, and I saw the first pitch, and I hit, hit a home run. And here we are in, in Tiger Stadium. And there's 55,000 packed in Tiger Stadium. There wasn't a day that I played that my first at bat that I didn't have butterflies. And you know, for 20 years and over over 11,000 at bats, I said he's not going to throw me a, a slider or a break or a fork ball. He's going to throw me a fastball. He's going to try to get ahead of me because I took a lot of pitches too. And I slam the bat down, and the donut comes flying off. I look right at Barrett and I go, I'm going deep on the first pitch. 
We are ready for the first pitch of the 86 season. I'm looking at Morrison. He winds up in the first pitch. is a little elevated, a little, a little out of my zone, but I was looking fastball. And here it is. Long drive, left center field. Way back, left center, and gone. Home run, Dwight Evans. No one was more surprised than this guy right here, me. I was so surprised running around those bases. It's just kind of a special year. We had a, we had a lot of fun. When you win, you have a lot of fun. A block has been called, and Evans comes home. And another impossible win for Boston. Everyone plays together. It's like working together. Everyone working together on the same page. And uh, your travel is better. You're, you're, uh, you're happier, you know, because you're there to win. And um, getting to the World Series was, was tough. And we won a huge game in Anaheim. I remember that game. Uh, that to me is as big as home run that Fisk hit, and it was big. Dave Henderson's home run was the biggest home run I ever saw. And the stadium police pushed us all out, the players, all out of the dugout. And Henderson still at the play because people are spilling onto the field. So they had to be in the dugout. And uh, so we're watching Henderson hit all of us through the legs of, of, of the stadium police. To left field and deep and down he goes back and it's gone. Unbelievable. And then when he hit that ball out of the ballpark, those stadium police were out of that, were out of that dugout within seconds. And all of a sudden, the crowd was quiet. You're looking at one for the ages here. Dwight led the Sox with nine runs batted in during the 1986 World Series, but he can still feel the pain of that victory slipping away. Two outs, two strikes. And I look out, I'm so thankful, I'm thanking, I'm praying to myself, I'm thanking God. I look over the scoreboard in left field and it says, congratulations to the 1986 world champion Boston Red Sox. I can see it like it was yesterday. And, it, 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 and we still hadn't got the last pitch. Raleigh's on the mound and a little bloop single. That's no big deal. We get two strikes on the next hitter, line drive single. Get two strikes on the next hitter, another base hit. And then the ground ball to first base. And uh, it just a uh, wild pitch, a wild pitch, and uh, just everything just fell apart. It just fell apart. And, and we actually played real tough in the seventh game. We played, uh, came back, we had the lead, and, and we came back, we, we almost tied it. Uh, they got the lead, we almost tied it. And uh, we weren't, we got beat, we got beat in, in, the, uh, in the seventh game. We, we didn't give that away. So it still hurts. Although the Sox didn't fare as well in 1987, Dwight had career highs with 34 homers and 123 runs batted in. Again, he was an all-star. At age 36, Dwight got his 2,000th hit and drove in 111 runs for the East Division champs of 1988. After driving in another 100 runs in 1989, the following season he was relegated to designated hitter. He hit just 249 with 13 home runs for the division champs. I broke my SI joint, which is in your lower back. And every time I slid, it would fuse together, and every time I slid, it'd break. So it was very painful. And when that 1990 season ended, the Sox released him. I went to Fenway Park about three or four days after the season. And just went in there and get in front of my locker and just clean my locker up and grab a few things that I wanted to take home. And Al Forster, who was on the ground crew, taps me on the shoulder and says, Dewey, Lou Gorman wants to see you upstairs. Joe Morgan's sitting in the corner, and uh, Lou uh, leans over on his desk and says, uh, uh, we've decided not to pick up your option. And people say to me, why, why did you leave? Why did you, go, why did you go to Baltimore? Well, I said I was fired. And, uh, well, why'd you, why'd you go down, was it, f you know, they thought I was a free agent, that I, that I would opt to go to Baltimore. And I wanted to stay in Fenway. Yeah. Anyway, um, it, was, uh, it was a tough time for me. Dwight Evans' emotional return to Fenway Park is next when the Red Sox Report, presented by CVS Pharmacy, continues.
In 1991, Dwight Evans played his only season in a uniform other than the Red Sox. On May 30th of 1991, the Sox right fielder for most of the 70s and 80s returned to Fenway Park as an Oriole. It was a very emotional time for me because here I was playing right field and in a Orioles uniform. And it was just awkward. It was awkward, but I came to the plate and, you know, I went on the field and people just, you know, very uh, generous to me. And, and every time I came to the plate, it was a standing ovation, you know, and I just, when I left there after four days, I was totally drained. I was just drained. It was good for me to see another organization and how they were run. The first thing they did when I went down there is they introduced me to everybody in their, in their front office. And I still didn't know everybody in the front office of the Red Sox. And, so it was kind of neat. It was kind of neat for me to go there, but of course I would have loved to have finished my career in, in Fenway, I mean, with the Red Sox, but it wasn't meant to be. Following that 1991 season, Dwight Evans retired as a player. He had played in more games as a Red Sox than anyone except Carl Yastrzemski. The Red Sox had almost promised me a job when I, when I got down, and, and uh, they said, well, we want you to manage in Roanoke, Virginia in the Carolina League. Now here I just spent 24 years being away from my family and now they wanted me to go down to spring training and leave my family for eight months. This would have been worse because I never would come home mm -hmm. and ride the buses again. I wasn't ready for that. So I talked to Jerry Reinsdorf and Jerry says, what do you want to do? Well, I said, I'd like to be a roving instructor and you know spend 10, 12 days on the road a month and you know, work with your players. I got to work with Mike Cameron, who was a young, he was 18, 19 years old at the time. And uh, I had a great time uh, working with Jerry Reinsdorf and, and the White Sox. I enjoyed that. They gave me what I wanted, and then I was there for two and a half years, and then a job came about where I went to Colorado Rockies and was the hitting coach there for a year, which I enjoyed. In 2000, Dwight Evans was inducted into the Red Sox Hall of Fame. There are many who feel his eight gold gloves and prolific hitting should earn him a place in baseball's Hall of Fame in Cooperstown as well. In the 80s, he hit more home runs uh, in the American League than anybody else, and also had more extra base hits in the 80s than anybody in baseball, both leagues combined. So in the 80s, you know, he was the best. Obviously, I'm prejudiced because he was one of my guys, okay? But putting that aside, home runs of 380, something like that, uh, almost 2,500 hits, uh, 1,400 RBIs, I think, on base percentage. The other thing about Dwight was that he ended up walking a lot, but not trying to pull the ball all the time. He watched the ball better and ended up walking 100 times a year and scoring a lot of runs. So to, to cut to the chase, I, th I think he belongs in the Hall of Fame. And that's just the offense. And then you got the, what was did you say, eight gold gloves? I think he belongs in there, I truly do. Dwight got better as time went on. That was a great way that he went through the 80s and showed what his career was. And I believe that's why he deserves to be elected into Cooperstown. Hall of Fame or not, Dwight forges ahead. He spent some of his time raising funds for neurofibromatosis research through his annual golf tournament. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks an awful lot. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And at home, his high school sweetheart still makes him laugh. 
you know, wasn't wasn't always perfect, and, and I don't think there is anybody that's perfect. But and if you, I was mad at him, but when he was leaving, I'd say, "Go out for four today." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I heard that once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> to be together for forty years, we don't take that for granted, and uh, it's it's neat that we can look back and I mean, look at her; she's beautiful. <laughs> Good she's beautiful. boy. She's beautiful, and I, I look forward to being with her till end of time. Dwight rejoined the Red Sox in 2001 as a roving instructor, and the next year was the Sox hitting coach. But in 2003, he was let go. He was still, however, a Red Sox at heart. I always loved the Red Sox, but I always loved the fans. And the fans, to me, were so important because they lived and died with baseball. If you busted your rear end and gave all you had, all you had, you as a particular player, they loved you, they respected you. And if you understood them, that they're emotional, that they're going to boo you and they're going to cheer you. There's times I want to boo myself, but I understood them. The Red Sox John Henry, Tom Warner, and Larry Lucchino respected Dwight's accomplishments so much that they honored him with a 2004 World Champions ring. All the pain that, that Red Sox fans have gone through for, gosh, 80, what, 86 years? It was done, it was finished. 2004 for me was exciting. You know, and, and uh, I loved it. I mean, I, I felt the joy. The new owners made all of us feel that we were part of it. And that was, that was awesome to be part of it, the way we were welcome to the ballpark. Dwight Evans will be welcome at Fenway Park for as long as it stands, because for most of the 1970s and all of the 1980s, he was part of the park, and to his countless fans, he always will be.